All right, hi everybody. So uh, this is Joe Minardi at West Virginia University, and uh, a while back I posted this image and uh, kind of asked folks what they thought it was, and thought I'd go over what we're doing here. So this is a continuous wave Doppler tracing through the aortic valve, and it does indicate some aortic stenosis, and I want to go over that a little bit. So just for you know, if there's anyone out there who hasn't done this a whole lot, just to make sure you know what what we're doing here, because it's, it's hard to tell from the still image. All we've really done here is we've gotten an apical five chamber view of the heart, so. You know, our fifth chamber here is visible, and we've stuck a uh, continuous wave Doppler gate right there in the aortic valve to get some velocities right through the valve. And when we do that, we get this tracing here. We've adjusted our line up and adjusted our scale to fit everything on the screen, and we see this velocity tracing, kind of a high velocity through the aortic valve. Now, one thing that I want you to remember is if your velocity is greater than roughly 250 centimeters per second or two and a half meters per second, then that's uh, likely indicative of aortic stenosis. And we'll talk about the different measurements and how you can figure this out. So here's the quick overview. First off, as always, who cares? Uh, why do I care about aortic stenosis? Does it really matter? This is, it's one of the most common valvular pathologies that we see. And once patients do develop symptoms, uh, they do have a high mortality. So it is an important valvular disease. And also, we always care about coronary artery disease in the emergency department. So if you see a uh, stiff, calcified aortic valve, there's a good chance that that patient also has coronary artery disease, whether it's been diagnosed or not. So just a little bit of background. This is a disease that's mostly of the elderly, mostly from degenerative changes that happen in the valve. However, younger patients in their 40s and 50s can develop problems with aortic stenosis, mostly due to congenital causes, and usually that's bicuspid valve. Rheumatic disease used to be more important, um, but that's less common in the United States, at least anyway. But that's another important cause of aortic stenosis. So here's a little bit of a diagram to just show you what some of these look like. So here's what your you know, normal aortic valve should look like. You should have nice thin cusps. They should come together well. In rheumatic heart disease, you'll see a lot of calcification right around the edges of the cusps. And so that's what it may look like. And that's where it causes a lot of stenotic change. What we'll typically see, what we see in the States, is a lot of calcific changes all around the valve. And usually this is pretty heavy before it becomes clinically significant and you'll get, uh, but still get some restricted opening. And then by cusp valve, you'll see a different shaped opening. You only have two cusps. Now they will develop calcifications later on and their calcifications may not look that severe uh, by the time they have significant stenosis. So the presentation, if they are at the point of becoming symptomatic, they'll have anginal symptoms, maybe syncope, and it's a generally progressive thing. So this is not something that's like acute coronary syndrome where they're sitting at rest and all of a sudden they get sudden onset chest pain because they've ruptured an unstable plaque. This is someone who has exertional symptoms, classically CHF and syncope, and usually they're okay at rest. So that's why I want to say, hold up a minute, do I need to be incredibly worried about this with all the millions of chest pain patients I see in my emergency department every single day? And I want you to relax, and I want you to realize that most of the time, no, because again, this is a different pathophysiology and somewhat different presentation. So remember, you know, take the whole clinical picture in mind when you're worried about this. So the contrast between the two, you know, over here on the side of the screen, aortic stenosis is slowly progressive, exertional symptoms that are usually better with rest. Uh, the classic triad is angina, heart failure, and syncope. Uh, so syncope patients, they might be a little bit worrisome, but typically this is going to be brought on by exertion. And acute coronary syndrome, different pathophysiology, right? You have an unstable plaque, it ruptures, and they develop symptoms that usually are harder to get rid of. So those are the people who are sitting there watching TV or, you know, having a turkey dinner and they develop chest pain and hard to get rid of and they have an acute coronary syndrome. So clinically, the presentations are pretty different. We see a lot fewer stable angina type patients in the emergency department and we see a lot more unstable angina or unclear chest pain. So think about the clinical contrast. A lot of the times this isn't what you're going to be worried about, but you know, take a good history and do a good physical exam to see if you see physical findings to make you figure this out. So let's talk about the echo. That's one part to me. So first things that you're going to notice are some of the 2D findings on echo. And the most important one is a calcified aortic valve. So here we see this is an aortic valve. It's pretty heavily calcified. And uh, you know, that's pretty easy to recognize. You don't need any special skills. If you can get a peristernal long axis view, you can usually recognize this. And other things you'll see as the pressure increases, the ventricle will respond by becoming hypertrophied. And this is usually in a concentric fashion. So just some examples of some concentric hypertrophy here in this short axis view and this long axis view here. This patient doesn't have a calcified aortic valve. And here's a, another image thanks to a Ketaman via Sonocloud that shows a very um, calcified aortic valve. So you see here 
heavily calcified little tiny squeak of an opening. It's just another example of a calcified aortic valve that you'll see. So this disease process, it exists along a spectrum in significant calcification all the way up to critical aortic stenosis. And most patients aren't going to have any symptoms until they're closer to this end of the spectrum. The things that you want to know and figure out from echo are their functional valve area and the flow gradient across the valve. And it sounds scary, it sounds difficult, but I'm going to try to make it easy for you. This really isn't that complicated once you've gotten kind of at the point of being able to consistently get pretty good views of the heart. So really it's three steps in measurement, and I'm going to go through it in probably more detail than you care about, but I'm going to try to make it easy for you. So the first thing, and I'll tell you why this is the first thing I do, is continuous wave through the aortic valve. And this is usually from an apical 5 or an apical 3 chamber view. And with that, you can get a peak velocity, and your machine will help you calculate a mean gradient and the aortic valve velocity time integral. Uh, I love anything that involves calculus. And then the next step is going to be same view, uh, pulse wave Doppler at your LVOT and that's going to help you calculate your LVOT VTI and then then you'll go to a peristernal long axis view and measure your LVOT diameter which I don't do in every patient unless this is one of my concerns or I'm trying to do some other hemodynamic parameters. So step one we're going to get an apical five chamber view or a three chamber view which we see here whichever one gives you the best most favorable angle so you want very important to get the angle of your Doppler tracing very parallel to flow so that that gate is exactly as close as perpendicular to the flow as possible. And sometimes you can put color on here if there truly is an aortic stenosis jet and help align your Doppler with the jet that's going through the valve. So apical 5 or apical 3, whichever one gives you the best angle for your Doppler gate. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I just said, I think. So it should look something like this. So this is a pretty good example of we've got a nice apical 5 chamber view here and we have a pretty good angle. We're pretty parallel to our flow. Flow is going this way. It's probably not exactly perfect, but this is pretty good. And in this patient, probably the best one that we could get. And this is what the continuous wave Doppler looks like, this little rhomboid kind of thing here. And you can see the CW right there, which I think we yeah, we boxed nice. Parallel to flow, really important. So once you, once you get your continuous wave Doppler gate right there in the aortic valve, you'll get a Doppler spectrum that looks a little bit something like this. And um, you'll see this the aortic flow, velocity of flow down below the line because your flow is going away from your transducer. So you may want to adjust your line height. You can move that up or down. Usually you're going to have to move it up a little bit and maybe change your scale to make sure you capture the full velocity profile of that aortic outflow right there. And then when you have one you like that has the highest velocities and the clearest tracing, then you want to freeze that and then you can make some measurements on that. So just to point out, there's our systolic aortic flow and there's our velocity scale. Again, make adjustments to your line, your line height, and your scale to get your whole systolic flow on the screen. And as you'll see in severe cases of aortic stenosis, you may need to go up to 500 on this scale. So after you've done that, you might be able to stop. And I think that's important because if you're doing this at the bedside in a clinic or in the emergency department, you don't want to spend any more time than you have to on something that's not going to change anything you do. If their maximum velocity and you've gotten a good tracing on this is less than 200, say, then aortic stenosis is not very likely. You can stop. You don't need to do any more calculations, any more measurements. And you're done. You can move on and uh, work up other problems or see another patient or do something else. However, if the velocity is higher and you're still worried about aortic stenosis, then continue and we'll go through what you do next. So we've got our tracing here. We're going to go ahead and get into our calculation package. Hopefully you've got a cardiac calculation package on your machine and it may not look exactly the same as this one that we're using here, but you're going to get into your section of aortic valve and first on you can do Vmax and line up your Vmax and put that into the machine there and save that. Right there it is. And then the next thing, you're going to choose the uh, VTI setting, which you can see right there, which is velocity time integral. And you're just going to trace the velocity profile through your aortic valve. And here's just another example of what that might look like. You can see tracing around the whole aortic stenosis jet there. And here we've got an example just measuring our Vmax. And you can see here our scale has moved up. It's in meters per second instead of centimeters. So we're at 800 centimeters per second or 8 meters per second to capture this high velocity aortic stenosis jet that we see in this 
patient example here. Okay, so you've done that. So really, all you've really done is you've gotten an apical five chamber at, or an apical three chamber, and you've lined up your continuous wave Doppler gate through the aortic valve. And then you make some measurements off of that. So the next step, kind of step two, is you just switch to pulsed wave Doppler, and we're gonna place it, the gate, right in our LVOT, which is just apical to the aortic valve. So if this was the clip that I had, I would be sticking that gate right in here, right apical to the aortic valve. And then we get another tracing, which looks a little bit similar, not exactly the same, but it's slightly different velocity profile through the LVOT. And then we're gonna do some measurements again, same thing. So we've got our measurement, we've got our tracing, gonna get the one that has our highest velocity, make sure we have a nice good quality tracing. And we're gonna go under the LVOT section of our calculation package, and we're gonna get our Vmax, and we're gonna trace to get an LVOT VTI. Store those, and then let your machine do all the calculus. Got that? There you go. And then next step, again, if we've moved on and we're worried about aortic stenosis, we're gonna get a parasternal long axis view. Now, you, if you're like me, you probably start with this view in most cases. And if you saw a bunch of calcification and you knew you were gonna do some measurements, you might do this at the beginning. Again, I'll, I usually don't start until I've looked at my continuous wave spectrum so I can see the velocity. Um, because if the velocity's low, I can stop. If it's higher, then I move on. Just my style. You do your own style. Anyway, parasternal long axis view, and what you want to do is you want to zoom in on that aortic valve so you get the best optimized view of your aortic valve that you can get, and then zoom in on it. And then you want to measure the LVOT during systole, so when your valve is wide open. So you're going to scroll back and forth a little bit until your valve is open. And uh, here, you can't see it that super well, but trust me, the valve is open here. And then we're gonna go again into our calculation package, our aortic settings, and then we get aortic settings and we get an LVOT diameter, and then that should bring up our calipers, okay? So right there they are, and we're gonna measure that diameter just apical, again, just before the valve annulus, and we're gonna get a nice perpendicular measurement, straight up and down, perpendicular to that LVOT outflow, and then save that calculation. And then that's pretty much it, you're done. Your machine will calculate some gradients for you and functional valve areas. And you should be able to hit some report screen, maybe save that, and you should get right here. We've got our aortic valve area, which is great. It's well above two and a half, which is good. Uh, you don't get critical until you're down to about uh, less than one or smaller than that. And then we've got here a mean gradient of 1.8 millimeters of mercury, which is very good. Uh, more than 10 is kind of where we start to get worried. So there they are, those are the things you worry about. And if we would have put a heart rate in here, we could have gotten also a cardiac output, which is something we use in hemodynamics as well. So just a few cautions, very important to get your ultrasound beam very parallel to your jet. So you have to get really good views and then get your best angle on your Doppler angle to your jet. Even small errors in your angle will lead to you know, underestimation of your velocities and may lead you to the, the wrong diagnosis. And so you should do multiple measurements. So I showed examples of doing one measurement each, but you should probably do at least three beats on the patient. And if they're an AFib, remember you're gonna have all different velocities because you have different filling patterns. So you need probably even more than that. And try different views. I would, if I was really worried and I had a patient who I was thinking maybe needs surgery or needs a definite referral, you know, before you put anybody down that surgical pathway, they need a bunch of views. So you would measure this from the five chamber, from the three chamber, and probably even use some alternate views in the echo lab with some right parasternal and some pencil tip Doppler only probes. Okay. So even if you suspect this and get some early information in the emergency department or at the bedside, uh, before anyone goes off to surgery, they're going to get some more detailed measurements probably in the echo lab. Uh, but back to that parallel jet thing. Remember, if you're not parallel, you're going to significantly underestimate your velocities. Just some other things to look out for, some of these other caution things. Sometimes if you're if there's an eccentric uh, mitral regurgitate jet that's going in the direction of the aorta or towards the inner atrial septum, sometimes that can wash into your aortic stenosis jet and give you false tracings. So just watch out for those, maybe look for those beforehand. Again, patients in AFib, they're a little bit more difficult because they're gonna have a lot of different velocities. So you wanna get even more measurements, maybe five or six and take an average. And then other thing that presents a challenge is patients who have poor left ventricular function because they aren't generating enough velocity to give you high velocity jets, even though they may have very significant aortic stenosis. So that's a whole different patient 
that usually needs to be evaluated probably with uh, stress echo imaging. Uh, so back to the original tracing that we posted up. So you can eyeball this. Now this is why I like to eyeball things initially to help me decide when to move on. So we've got our continuous wave Doppler, we've got our velocity tracing, and we can see here our max velocity is probably close to 400. So that's someone we look at, we know, okay, we've got to do some more measurements and get um, more details and get more specific with this. And then again, we'll take that jet, we'll get our VTIs and our max velocities and just some numbers to throw at you. If you look at textbooks, I said 25, 250 centimeters, but at strict definitions, max velocity greater than 2.6 meters per second or 260 centimeters per second and a mean pressure gradient of 10 millimeters of mercury and I put down here if you want to know things like simplified Bernoulli equation the gradients calculated by four times the velocity squared and then the uh, aortic valve orifice area of less than 2.5 is where you start to get in and that's just mild aortic stenosis and here's some other math calculations if you really like to be super nerdy like I kind of do sometimes those are there please go memorize those and here's a table looking at uh, some of our different spectrum of disease so normal all these numbers here so less than 10 less than I, I just remember 25 or 250 because that's easier number for me to remember because also correlates with your valve area so if you have a peak velocity less than 250 centimeters per second and an aortic valve area of greater than two and a half centimeters squared you're good but even there you don't get to severe or critical until you get really severe like gradients of 45 velocities of four meters per second and valve areas of around a centimeter so those are actually relatively easy numbers to remember and know that even if you see some aortic stenosis, it's got to be pretty severe before they get into like surgical candidate. So, but again, you're at the bedside, you're in the clinic, you're in the emergency department, and you don't want to spend 20 minutes or 45 minutes even doing a bunch of measurements on someone who has a low likelihood of disease. So if you see someone and you see a calcified aortic valve, because that's the first thing you're probably going to notice. And Hopefully they have good left ventricular function. Get an apical five or an apical three, stick continuous wave through their aortic valve. And if their max velocity is less than 250 centimeters per second or two and a half meters per second, you're done. If it's higher than that, then you wanna maybe spend some more time or maybe you might decide, you know what, it's higher than normal and I need to refer them and let someone else do these measurements. That's perfectly okay. So you can really take one measurement with continuous wave Doppler through your aortic valve and then decide how much further do you want to go with this versus referral, or can you be done and say aortic stenosis is really unlikely in this patient? So there's a couple other reasons that I care about aortic stenosis, why I think this is an interesting topic. I think if you're a fellow or a resident who has a lot of interest in ultrasound and echo, particularly doing things like this and learning about this helps you understand your just cardiovascular physiology, which I think is a good thing for all of us. And and if you're interested in echo, this makes you just practicing this really build some of your echo skills because you have to really be good at consistently getting good views and you have to have some understanding of Doppler and this kind of reinforces some of the principles of Doppler. And then just doing this and recognizing how powerful echo really is. It really can show you, it gives you real time physiology that you can see. And I think that's really cool. And that's one of the things I love about ultrasound. So just a little quick summary on some of the important key facts on aortic stenosis. It is pretty common. It's a great way, just looking at this is a great way to reinforce your echo skills and uh, build your understanding of Doppler and how it really works. And it's really good at showing the utility of what ultrasound can really do for you. Just key things to remember about doing it. There's a few measurements, but really they're pretty easy. Your Doppler angles are very important to make sure you don't underestimate your velocities. And just remember that 25 or 250 number. If your velocity is greater than 250 centimeters per second, then you might need to do further imaging or referral. And I think that's pretty much it. I hope uh, you like that as much as I did. Thanks.